On that note, it's truly a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to introduce Melody Reefer. Um, Melody has spent 20 years of experience in the mental health uh, system as a service provider and in policy administration and advocacy. She was the founding director of the Peer Project, a 100% consumer-run vocational training program in Atlanta, Georgia, one of which I think one of our other RRTCs is trying to get some evidence based on. As the author of the manual, George's Consumer Driven Road to Recovery, Melody was part of a team that developed the Peer Specialist Certification Program in Georgia. It was the first state in the nation to successfully bill Medicaid for peer services. I think we have, what, about, we're close to about 30 now who are using some form of that. In, 19, um, in 2003, Melody became the first director of the Office of Consumer Affairs for the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. And the important piece there is what you need to know is that Melody, her boss there is now my boss. Very important. <laughs> very important. So you've got to be sure you give her, you know, when we're ready, she gets a very big round of applause because she has a very big connection. So she was in Oklahoma, um, and then she's currently serving as the project director for the University of Kansas School of Social Welfare Shared Decision-Making Project, which is led by uh, Pat Deegan. Um, Melody is known throughout the country as a passionate and entertaining speaker and trainer, and is committed to systems transformation to ensure that all mental health care and supported services are delivered in a recovery-based, consumer-driven manner. So help me uh, get Melody up here. Thanks, Risa. And good morning to y'all. Um, y'all, I blew it. I was not going to talk Southern. Um, I was determined that I was going to sound incredibly professional and uh, accent neutral today. Um, however, that's gone, so welcome to the Melody Show. I. I had uh, a song and dance routine, a huge production that I was going to begin this morning with, uh, but then they said, you know what, we're working with a single camera for the recording, so you have to stand still. So I'm sorry. No dancing, no singing, um, you know, no overhead shots of people moving like this, and, you know, and, um, and so you're just stuck with me and a podium. For the people that I can't see who are behind poles, um, I would want to tell you that I look incredibly awake and <laughs> polished today, and I'm sure you do as well. Um, gosh, day two of a four-day training on an incredibly important topic, and what is it that I can contribute to the knowledge base of such an esteemed group of people. Um, I think what I'd like to start with is a review of a fairly recent headline from Psychiatric News. The psychiatrist of tomorrow will need to be part general physician to ensure that people with serious mental illness are not robbed of years of their lives. Now, I was under the false impression that psychiatrists were part general physician. Um, and so I was a little astounded by, by this statement. And I'm sure the folks who are psychiatrists were wondering what they did all those years in medical school. Um, but there is a need, there is a uh, cry to go back to what we know is true, and that is that people with serious mental illness are people. It's a radical thought. Um, it's a notion that sometimes gets in the way of policy, but it's a reality. A landmark report on comorbid medical and mental illness recommends that people with serious mental illness be designated as a distinct health disparities population under the federal government's initiative to reduce disparities in health outcomes. 
That was just one recommendation in the extensive report, Morbidity and Mortality in People with Serious Mental Illness, released by the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. The report documents striking evidence from state studies showing that people with serious mental illness die on average 25 years earlier than the general population, and that about 60% of these premature deaths are from natural causes such as cardiovascular and pulmonary disease. By the end of this conference, you should have those quotes memorized. But there's more to the story. I want to take you back to the fall of 1996. I'm sitting in my office and the phone rings. It's my supervisor calling. She says, Melody, you need to know before you go into group that Jay died. No, we don't know what happened. Yes, he was doing great. No, not suicide. He was in his apartment. 38. No one had seen him since Thursday. Maybe a heart attack. You know, sometimes people who have a serious mental illness just die. Oh, he's your first. Sorry. Stay in this business long enough. And there will be more. Be prepared for questions in group. What my supervisor didn't know at that time was that I was living with a serious mental illness. Six months off disability. Still working on getting just the right med cocktail worked out. Still reeling from the last six years of hospitalizations, homelessness, suicidality. And now, after finding some sure footing, I learned about the widely known yet not frequently discussed phenomenon of sudden death and mental illness. I have stayed in the field and I have experienced more loss. People I've called friends, people I've worked with as a provider of services, people I've loved. I can tell from your faces that you have too. It's why we're here. Similar reports like the one released by Nashbid have been let over the years. The United Kingdom in 2007, Australia in 2005, even early reports by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in 1999 have stated the obvious. We know that people living with serious mental illness die at a younger age and that they die for bad reasons more than those without serious mental illness. Some of the factors report, uh, re some of the reports focus on issues of poverty and lifestyle as a contributing factor for the increased mortality rate. Some reports focus on biological factors. Some simply don't speculate, but report the numbers. Some look for a correlation between diagnosis and or medications as a causative <laughs> factor. I'm not stating anything new. You heard it yesterday, you'll hear it more today and over the next couple days. It's why we are here, but as I've stated, my interest is not primarily clinical or scientific. My interest is personal. I know that people just like me are dying prematurely, and that's amazingly personal. As Risa was going through the list of some of the health problems. I thought, oh my God, I'm the poster child. <laughs> uh, 
diabetes, obesity. I was a smoker for a million years, though. In two weeks, I will celebrate one year uh, smoke-free. No small feet. Um, but it's like, you know, that, that's scary, you know. And I just got my life back. It's personal. This isn't just a couple of days of talking about numbers or genomes or whatever, you know? It's personal. I have a genome in my front yard. He's, he's, <laughs> he's like the little Travelocity guy. Um, uh, that's probably not right. I should never deviate from the script. <laughs> So, <clears throat> where do we go from here? We are a room full of scientists, people in recovery, providers, movers and shakers, induced by medicine or not. Um, <laughs> and our job is to know more when we leave than when we arrived. So, where do we go from here? In his book, Borrowed Time, AIDS activist and poet Paul Monet states, grief is a sword or it is nothing. I think that if we look at the intersection between science and social movements, we will find our direction. We will find our urgency. We will be able to understand that we must harness all that everyone knows in order to help each other heal and that healing should be focused on the whole person. The commissioners of the President's New Freedom Report on mental health states that mental health is essential to overall health. And for that statement to be true, then overall health is essential for mental health. In mental health, much of the passion for healing as an alternative to hopelessness has come from the consumer, survivor, ex-patient movement. Many people have been and are speaking about recovery, so much so that the word seems to have taken on a life of its own. It has become such a successful idea that it is even experiencing some backlash, which, when you think about it, just might be the highest measure of success for a social change movement. But the truth is, recovery is real. So let's look at a quick definition of terms. SAMHSA has released a consensus statement defining mental health recovery as a journey of healing and transformation, enabling a person with a mental health problem to live a meaningful life in a, in a community of his or her, her choice while striving to achieve his or her potential. Hmm. As definitions go, it's not a bad one, but it seems to lack a little bam, you know, a little, a little spice, a little a little flavor. Um, recovery, for me, is being more than a diagnosis. I'm a daughter. I'm an aunt. I'm a fantastic aunt. Let me, let me qualify that. <laughs> I am the aunt to end all aunts. I am the cool, and, cool rockin', tattooed, pierced aunt in a very conservative family. <laughs> um, so many extra points for that. I'm a partner. I'm a student. I'm learning to be a researcher. I'm a poet. I'm a singer. Um, I am trying to learn to become a drummer. I have no natural rhythm. Um, I'm a thinker, I'm a jokester, um, 
and I have recovery. I have flavor. I have more than a diagnosis that informs and directs and makes more wonderful this thing that is my life. But back to SAMHSA. Upon the release of the consensus statement, Charles Curry, the past administrator, stated, recovery must be the common recognized outcome of the services we support. This consensus statement on mental health recovery provides essential guidance that helps us move towards operationalizing recovery from a public policy and public financing standpoint. Individuals, families, communities, providers, organizations and systems can use these principles to build resilience and facilitate recovery. Risa has already outlined the 10 fundamentals of recovery, but I want to say just a little bit more about those. Self-direction is active. It is not a theory. It is not a philosophy. It is something we do. Room needs to be made for self-direction. Individualized and person-centered care in public services. I'm sure you see the difficulty. I, I, I recently moved to Lawrence, Kansas, and it's a, it's a wonderful community, but they have more cookie-cutter duplex houses in this one community than I have seen anywhere in my entire life. My first night in my cookie-cutter duplex home, um, someone walked in the door. <laughs> because he thought it was his new cookie cutter <laughs> duplex home. I kid you not. I'm like, oh, and he's like, oh. <laughs> he lived next door, <laughs> continues to, and we both blush a little when we see each other. <laughs> and it's a bit like public services. It's really difficult to take time for the individual and to deliver individualized care. There's a section of Lawrence that has these beautiful craftsmen and uh, Victorian style homes where, I mean, you definitely don't get confused about which one's yours. <laughs> but you know what? They cost an arm and a leg. And so far, and probably not ever, I don't make an arm and a leg. I make a toe and a finger. <laughs> and I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm not complaining. Um, but a toe and a finger does not an arm and a leg house make. And so I, so somehow I've got to, I've got to personalize this, this cookie cutter home. And so one way is my little genome. <laughs> uh, nobody else has one. Um, you know, and, and we leave the lights on at night because um, that's helpful too. Uh, and, and so far, it seems as though the garage door opener really only works on ours. <laughs> um, so far. And so in mental health, we need to make room for individuals as well. And maybe that's in the way we do relationships. Because you know what? A relationship is powerful, and a relationship is personal, and a relationship doesn't cost more. People can't say, oh, but we're not funded for that. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, you are. It's called humanness. 
Empowerment. It's very difficult to empower, and it's exceedingly easy to disempower. I don't usually like to focus on the negative, but if we were to stop disempowering people, we would see a lot more empowerment. Yeah, my, my, my friend and mentor who, who helped me actually get to be here today, uh, Pat Deegan, she uses the term microaggressions, which I think is a bit like having a pebble in your shoe. It might be small, but they become incredibly painful. And so even if we, while we struggle to learn how to empower people, if we just stop disempowering people, we've gone a long way. Holistic care. I like to spell holistic with a W, because you know, it makes it uh, easier to understand. The whole damn person. The whole kit and caboodle. My litany of who I am, daughter, jokester, poet, singer, wonderful aunt, are the things that make me a whole person. The conditions I have, diabetes, obesity, mental illness, strange syndromes that nobody really knows what they are even, because I get to be special, um, also contribute to my being a whole person. The relationship that I have with my care, primary care provider is as important as the relationship that I have with my psychiatrist, and they better know each other. Because if one medication makes me bleed easy, I'm in a whole lot of trouble. It's personal. Nonlinear. Do you know what nonlinear means? When you think about the path of recovery, it's not that. <laughs> um, ask anybody here who has ever recovered from anything, anywhere, and you know that that's not it. It's circuitous, uh, it's redundant, it's reflective. It stops. It's maze-like. Choose any of those images. Increase it exponentially, and that's the path of recovery. And it's all a good path. Failure is as vital to recovery as success. Mistakes are as informative as correct answers. Risks are incredibly educational. It's good that it's not nonlinear. Strengths based. KU School of Social Welfare is known throughout the country for developing the strange space case management curriculum. I get the opportunity um, to work with a couple of the guru guys on strange space case management, and it's remarkable because the thing about strange space case management is that it's based on acknowledging the whole person. <laughs> it makes sense. The Dalai Lama teaches that which we give energy grows. So if we work from a deficit perspective, we're feeding, we're throwing manure on deficits. And so guess what's going to grow? Deficits. <coughs> if we feed strengths, if we put the strengths of an individual in the sunlight, guess what's going to grow? 
It's the difference between focusing on illness and focusing on wellness. Peer support. I love peer support. I was engaged in peer support before I had ever heard the term. I have a friend um, in, in the, in the uh, southern mountains of Oklahoma. I bet you didn't know there were southern mountains of Oklahoma, but there are. And he's from there. And, um, and what he says about peer support, he says, you know what? I'm pretty sure that the first peer specialist was Jesus. You know, it's like, ah, oh, there you go, dude. You know, peer support is a naturally occurring phenomenon that occurs between people who know each other. And at its best, that's what peer support is. And so we can wrap some training and education and technical support around peer support, and we can formalize it, and we can get uh, reimbursement for it, and what that makes it is formalized peer support. But the beauty of peer support is the stuff that happens when two people look at each other and go, sister, brother, we know each other. And then magic happens. And sometimes it's hard to document magic, just so you know. You have to get creative with that. <laughs> respect, respect, respect. Genuine, honest, unadulterated respect. <coughs> I have learned the most from those people I thought I wouldn't. When I've allowed myself to get out of the way and be open to what the other has to offer me, to put aside my own isms, and we all come with them, in spite of how good we try to be, we all come with them. But when I get out of my own way and stay open to what the other can teach me, and to me, that's respect. Responsibility. <laughs> the bane of every parent's existence, I guess. That's what my mom said. <laughs> I, 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 responsibility is tricky. I mean, we can get all you know, um, existential about it and, you know, talk about, you know, the more responsibility you take, the more freedom you have and, you know, um, yay for Viktor Frankl and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I think that one of the things that we in this arena um, have to acknowledge is that we've spent several uh, generations protecting people from having responsibility. And so to now invoke responsibility upon everyone um, means that there might be a learning curve. I think a really positive role for those of us who serve people in this work is to think of ourselves as physical therapists who are helping people overcome atrophy, that we have allowed many, many people in this system to atrophy. And, um, and one of the muscles that may have atrophied is, are the muscles that are about responsibility. And if you've ever undergone physical therapy, you know that that process <laughs> is painful. But that's the commitment we need to make to people if, in fact, we're going to say that responsibility is an important piece of recovery. And then, of course, the greatest of these is hope.
I think it's interesting to note that these principles are very similar to the expectations one has about general health care services. <coughs> Contemporary hospital communities now organize around such components as healing partnerships, architectural and interior design supportive of health and healing, the importance of the nurturing nature of nutrition, empowering patients through information and education, involvement of family, friends, and social support, the human touch and healing arts, and viewing the hospital as a partner in developing healthy communities. These particular elements are drawn from the Plain Tree organization that works with almost 100 hospitals all over the nation. Several years ago now, I was working for a community hospital in Atlanta that had adopted the Plain Tree model. The hospital's CEO at the time was an interesting man who had built his career on going into organizations that were not doing well and turning the ship around. He was bold and innovative and not one to shy away from trying on new programs and abandoning them, them quickly if they didn't work. What this meant was that those of us on his staff um, had better have thought through our ideas pretty thoroughly before speaking them because we might find that we needed to put them into place pretty quickly. And that if we really believed in them, they better work quickly. He was kind of um, a ready, shoot, aim guy. But all of this is to say he wasn't afraid of risks. He knew what he wanted, and that was to be the hospital that family members referred family members to. That was his standard. Nothing else would do. I think about him now, and I try to measure my work against his standard. Would I want my family member to have these services? And when it comes to recovery-oriented services, that is the standard for me. I have a 10-year-old niece who, much to my dismay, is now taking psychotropic medication. Am I helping to develop programs that I want her to participate in should she need them. <clears throat> they must be excellent because she is excellent. Turning ships. It doesn't happen on a dime, but we know that successful business models rely on the lessons of successful business models. Let's apply the idea of turning around this ship we call mental health services. As a business model, general health care has had to develop effective tools for managing difficult decisions. We know that most decisional conflict or uncertainty occurs at the point of weighing benefits against risks. With a complex medical history of my own, and now as a daughter committed to assisting my mother in making good decisions, I know I frequently feel overwhelmed with all the information and the array of choices that exist. How does one make life and death decisions? One of the most innovative practices developing general, in general health care is that of supporting people with important health care uh, choices through the decision process. As a visiting scholar, Dr. Annette O'Connor is doing some important work at the Health Decision Research Center of Dartmouth Medical School. She's developing an array of decision aids to help people through their decisional conflict or uncertainty. One tool that she has developed is the Ottawa Decision Aid, a guided questionnaire that assists the decision maker in feeling more informed and confident in their decision. 
In her preliminary work, done while working with the Ontario Ministry of Health and published in 1999, Dr. O'Connor was already identifying some key takeaway points. First, many patients facing medical decisions feel uninformed and uncertain about which option to choose. Second, the Ottawa decision aids are a series of evidence-based, self-administered tools to prepare people to make selected decisions. Three, people like information to be presented simply. Four, while decision aids rarely change one's predisposition, they help one become better informed and more aware of their own personal <coughs> values. Yet decision aids have the greatest impact among people who are uncertain about which option to choose. And finally, she learned that decision aids complement but do not replace counseling by practitioners. So that looks pretty good for general health care. But what other disciplines might be using decision support aids in mental health? <clears throat> a number of years ago now, at Virginia Commonwealth University, um, a joint project between their Employment Support Institute and the School of Business was created with funding from the Social Security Administration. Their goal was to create a software-based, <clears throat> excuse me, a software-based decision support aid that would assist individuals with disabilities in making informed decisions regarding benefits management and employment wages. The result was a program called WorkWorld, basically utilizing a series of what-if scenarios. WorkWorld simulates the financial effects of earned income on net income for Social Security disability insurance and for Social Security insurance income. Section 8 housing and food steps, and it recommends how to use the incredibly underutilized Social Security work incentives to boot. With an elaborate help section that manages to tame the Medusa-like intertwined rules of Social Security work incentives, people are able to try on various employment situations before making any life-altering decisions. I know from personal experience that there's no greater threat to recovery than the financial crisis that comes with learning you shouldn't have really been getting that last year of SSDI. So decision support aids are a good thing. <laughs> I, I wish work world had come out about three years sooner than it did. Decision support aids in psychiatric medical clinics? Yes. It's new, but it's happening. So if we reflect on the key principles of recovery uh, and compare it to the statement from a paper that Dr. Deegan and Dr. Robert Drake wrote recently. They state choice, self-determination, and empowerment are foundational values for people with disabilities, including people with psychiatric disabilities. Shared decision-making is a clinical model that upholds these values. It helps to bridge the empirical evidence base which is established on population averages with unique concerns, values, and life context of the individual. Shared decision making is a respectful, consumer driven process that makes sense. Embedding these theories and processes into traditional and non-traditional service systems is going to create change. The partnership that must exist between the provider 
and the service recipient for full exploration of decisional conflict or uncertainty will help turn the ship. Can it work with psychiatric medication? When it comes to recovery and the use of medication, almost all people, service providers and service recipients alike, seem to need to steady themselves for a roller coaster ride. Historic language has relied on terms like compliance and resistance and has helped to create an almost adversarial relationship between those who give pills and those who take pills. Lack of education and the soft discrimination of withholding information for someone's own good has led to decades of blind obedience or distrustful relationships. Talking about meds with people in recovery is a bit like talking about, you know, the things we aren't supposed to talk about. Among my peers, there is a hypersensitivity around whether one uses medication to contribute to recovery or not. And you never know if you should be glad you don't, or glad you do, or maybe you should lie and say you do when you don't, or <laughs> what's the right answer? So now bring in a doctor. If I can't talk to my peers, if I can't talk to my friends, if I can't talk to my compatriots about my uncertainty about medication, how am I ever going to be able to talk to my prescriber? If my mother, spouse, boss doesn't want to talk to me about how I use prayer as a tool for wellness, why do I think my nurse will listen? And what about embarrassing things like sexual dysfunction or incontinence or random lactation, especially when my life experience doesn't prepare me to be able to use nice words? And if you told me that the medicine was so good it's worth a little drooling, <laughs> where do we start? I think we start by acknowledging the experts. Again, quoting doctors Deegan and Drake, the trend is away from compliance and toward shared decision making, which entails a process of collaboration to arrive at a mutually acceptable plan for moving forward in the treatment process. This method involves two experts, one who knows the scientific literature and has clinical experience, and one who knows his or her own preferences and subjective experiences. They continue by writing, in the shared decision-making paradigm, the language of medical authority, compliance with therapy, and coercive treatments disappears in favors of terms and concepts like education, working alliance, individual experience, informed choice, collaborative experiments, and self-management of illness. So, the University of Kansas School of Social Welfare and Dr. Deegan have now established the first decision support center in a medication clinic. We are seeing how people use decision aids I get to spend almost all my time <laughs> in this new pilot site. And I get to watch people use decision aids. One of the most remarkable things is to see how people are using computer-assisted technology. 
a software program designed by Dr. Deegan to prepare for medication appointments with their prescriber. Peer support groups and case management support is helping to bring the often compartmentalized sections of the service program together in a way that not only supports but has buy-in from the person being served because they are leading the way. Medical staff is reporting deeper, richer experiences with the people they see. One overwhelming comment focuses on the way decision aids and computer-assisted technology helps to create a mutual lexicon between the provider and the recipient, and this shared language adds clarity and decisiveness to the decision-making process. Common ground is just that. The common ground software which is the core of the Decision Support Center, begins a dialogue. It is the expression of thought, action, and belief based on the perspective of the person with the lived experience that then joins with the knowledge, recommendations, and the opinion of the technician. The common ground experience begins before touching a computer, though. Most users are introduced to a couple of basic concepts which contributes to the integration of shared language for all participants. People are introduced to the concepts of pill medicine, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's the stuff we take to be well. And then are also introduced to the idea of personal medicine. Personal medicine is the unique way of naming the things we do to be well. Think wellness tools. People are asked to think about their personal medicine and identify things they do to be well. A true to life sampling of personal medicine identified by participants in the Kansas pilot includes such things as swimming, hence the picture, um, walking my dog, taking a shower, fishing, going to the movies, coffee shop with friends, singing gospel music. Then, and sometimes drawing from their list of personal medicine items, people are asked to develop a power statement the power statement becomes like a North Star, defining belief by which they navigate their recovery. Some samples of power statements are, my kids are the most important thing in my life and they are vital to my recovery. I'm not willing to sacrifice being a good mom to schizoaffective disorder or to medication side effects. We must work together to find a medication that will support, not interfere with, my ability to be a good mom. A power statement. A North Star. Or someone else's power, power statement reads, I like meditating because it relaxes me and helps me think more positively. I don't want my medication to get in the way of my meditation. These items are then entered into a database that populates the Common Ground software so that each person can have a uniquely personal experience in using the program. Each person's current list of pill medicine also becomes a part of the package so that the interplay or interdependence between what we do to be well and what we take to be well can be further explored. As people come into the med clinic, they are greeted by a peer specialist. That is, someone who has the lived experience of recovery and who is willing to share about their experience for the benefit of the other. 
People who need technical assistance to use the touchscreen-based computer system are supported through its use. Care has been given to make the software accessible for all people. So the first option people are presented with is a choice to read the program in a text and graphical interface or to listen to the program utilizing media files that use a combination of spoken word and graphical cues. Various components of the software program focus on the sharing of recovery stories via embedded video files. An assessment scale that measures both safety and psychosocial attributes and a decisional profile that explores commonly experienced areas of uncertainty and conflict. All of these ultimately comprise the common ground experience. Dr. Deegan developed the scale after exhaustive qualitative interviews with first-person experts participating in public mental health services in the Midwest. Together, she and the participants identified 11 domains of decisional conflict or uncertainty. They are concerns about side effects, health concerns, confusion, active exploration of other options, medications unhelpful, motivation, fear, the need for more support, drug and alcohol use, logistical problems, and beliefs. The final focus of the program guides people in identifying their goal or goals for the specific medication appointment. People are then given a personalized copy of their computer-generated report to take into the appointment with their nurse or prescriber. This one-page report serves as a focus point for the appointment and assists both the care provider and the participant in the shared, de shared decision-making process. One of the interesting things that I think has developed out of this very simple intervention is, is a physical change in how people sit with each other. When, when two people are looking at a common piece of paper, you go from facing to sharing. Um, and and just, that, just that change in the physical alignment um, is really changing the dynamics of the conversation. Not all, but most appointments will result in a shared decision being made. The care provider and the participant zero in on an activity or process, and this is then entered into the Common Ground database. The participant is then directed to any number of supporters or resources to help them meet the shared decision goal. The care provider also has to access, also has access to a number of supporters or resources to help them keep their responsibility end of the shared decision. An integral part of the common ground experience is the build out of an array of interventions to consider that can broaden the care provider's response to certain areas of concern or conflict. These interventions can be active and dynamic, or they can be passive and reflective. They are all supportive and respectful of each person's unique process. The pilot project in Kansas began in earnest in October 2006. It is remarkable the way all participants, both consumers and providers, have embraced this new opportunity. Lessons are being learned on an almost daily basis, and this work will contribute to the ever-increasing need we have to develop innovative and recovery-oriented best practices. I paraphrase the often repeated comments of one of the participating nurses in the Kansas pilot, pilot who has said, common ground informs and transforms the way I practice. I thought I was hearing and responding to people in a compassionate way before. But since embracing the concept of acknowledging all the experts in the room, 
I find that my expertise is more welcomed and informative when I give due consideration to the expertise and the experience of the other. The six identified goals of the new Freedom Commission on Mental Health are succinctly and creatively addressed in this shared decision initiative. We do need to understand that mental health is essential to overall health. Mental health care can be consumer driven. Disparities in mental health services can be eliminated. Screening, assessment, and referral to effective services can be commonplace. We should expect the care to be excellent and accelerated research should contribute to the body of knowledge. And we must leverage all that is beneficial and equalizing about integrating the best technology has to offer. The ship is turning. The need to improve services and integrate general health and mental health care has never been more important. People are developing co-occurring illnesses that threaten both the quality of their life and the longevity of their life. And this need is juxtaposed to the very real need for transformation within the mental health system. The urgency, however, cannot leave out the voice of the lived experience. The same way a shared decision must occur between two acknowledged experts, the course and direction of change in the mental health system must include the expertise of the trained and the expertise of those with the lived experience. We can't afford to do this in a ready, shoot, aim approach. The stakes are too high. People are dying. Believe in recovery and help people live long enough to enjoy it. Thank you. And I met my goal of some opportunity for dialogue. So if you have any questions or comments, thoughts that you can help me learn from, I'd, I'd love to hear those. I see that hand. What you just said. Yes, and I, and I apologize. Um, I can make those available to you. And I will get with the conference um, folks about the best way to do that. Short of that, um, my email address is there. And, um, and if you email me, I'll send it to you. Do you have any knowledge of or experience with the application of decision making in this way or anything like it for uh, advanced directives? Um, that's really interesting. One of the tools that we're building out for the pilot project is actually to have um, uh, available to people information about advanced directives. Um, it certainly, I think, is worthy of um, having its own kind of infrastructure, and, and that's not a part of this, but helping people understand what their rights are is an important part of any decision making around mental health care. Uh, and so essentially what we've done in this pilot project is make sure people know what the law is for their community because, um, you know, it's different in every state. Um, we provide them with, um, right now we're using the Bazelon uh, tool kit work sheet um, to, to help people go through that process. Uh, the, the other option is to give people um, uh, access to knowledge about using um, power of attorney because in many states um, uh, 
it's important to make sure that you name, the, the most simple way is that you name someone who will respect your wishes. of the advanced directives are getting filled out. Right. And what they discovered in their study was that unless there was a facilitated process, yeah. that it did not occur. Right. And so this seems so germane, what you're doing to this, and that you've chunked down the process for doing the medications. And I'm thinking advanced directives because they're really quite you know, large or many domains to consider that and, and quite complicated. But I was just thinking that there needs to be some chunking down right. I'm working with, but I really don't know more about what to do. With Joan's going to make a request. I, I will, yes, I will be, I will try to be mindful of that. And so the discussion about um, uh, advanced directives, I think that if we also look at the work that Annette O'Connor has said about the process at its best is going to be simple. And, and in many ways, the process for advanced directives are not simple for psychiatric advanced directives, but for medical advanced directives, it really is. So as we allow the general healthcare community to inform some of the processes that we do in uh, psychiatric healthcare, I think we're going to be able to learn some more simple ways of doing that. In the back, I just want to let people know um, there are two articles appearing in the Psychiatric Rehabilitation Journal in the summer issue. One of them is authored by Pat Deegan, um, and it's a preliminary article about the medication software and the use of it in a program. And there's also another article about advanced directives by uh, Anna Shayette. So both those uh, will be appearing in the summer issue. That announcement was to look for um, additional articles on this topic in uh, coming copies, uh, coming editions of the Psychiatric Rehab Journal. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to mention, too, first a question. Yes. I know that Pat Deegan uh, is, does collaborate with Larry Davidson at the Yale Program on Recovery and Community Health in New Haven, Connecticut. Yes. Uh, did she do this in collaboration with him, or was this one of just her own projects? Um, this is primarily uh, a joint project between she and the University of Kansas. Okay. And is Dennis Salibi still there? Is he one of the strength-based gurus? In Kansas? Yeah. I'm afraid that's not a person I'm familiar with, okay. but I spend so much... Strength-based work. I know I've read some of his work. He did a, a very interesting one-page piece on uh, strength-based strength DSM-4. It's, it's very cool to read. Oh, wow. Uh, I'll have to uh, look for that. One other thing, uh, it may not be as good as, I don't know if it's, this, if it's the same or different, but Mary Ellen Copeland, uh, who, the founder of the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, yes. uh, does provide um, some advanced directives through, through the Copeland Center that's in Arizona yes. and through Focus on Recovery United, which is in East Hartford, Connecticut. Yes, and let me repeat that for the benefit of the group and for the recording. Um, the work that Mary Ellen Copeland has done is inclusive of some great advanced directive um, uh, tools around uh, crisis planning, and uh, and that can be accessed through the wellness uh, 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 place in Arizona. <laughs> How's that for forgetting a word? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, actually, the, the list of fundamentals of recovery, uh, I use that specific list because it has been released as a consensus statement from uh, the Center of Mental Health Services, uh, and it was a list that was created by the gathering of some really great minds. I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> or, else, or else education probably would have made the list. Um, <laughs> however, uh, I, I don't want to insinuate that the list is necessarily uh, inclusive or, or a panacea. Um, because recovery is such a unique process, it's going to be different for each person. My essential components 
for recovery would include music, for instance. Yeah, um, and, 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 and making sure that I sing every day is part of how I stay well, much to the chagrin of most of the people in my life. <laughs> but, um, and, and other people do unique things. And so that's just uh, a list by way of reference. But I, I think that you're right on that education um, does play a key role. I think that that drives a lot of the shared decision-making process uh, because so much of it ends up being about tools that help people gain more knowledge so that they can make informed decisions. And informed decisions based on the perspective of the recipient as opposed to the, um, the risk, uh, safety and risk person of the agency. Uh, there was a hand over here, I think. Ah, dreaming. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, I guess just first a comment in that it's really impressive to see this kind of work being done um, when shared decision making is so cutting edge in general health care and to see something in psychiatry and mental health care on the same edge as something in general health care is really impressive. Um, it's usually lagging behind, so it's great to see it up there with it. I'm wondering if you can speak um, a bit to the process of engaging the medical staff with the software and how that worked and sort of the buy-in. Sure. The question is about engaging the medical staff, um, and I would broaden that a bit to um, all, the, all the traditional providers uh, with the software. And one of the advantages that we had in the pilot project is the, the um, <clears throat> pilot version of the software uh, was developed to work within um, the electronic medical record that this particular community mental health center used. And that helped in many ways in getting the support and buy-in of, of the uh, traditional providers because they were already accustomed to doing work that was computer-based. Um, future uh, versions of the software are, are going to be uh, <coughs> On, a, on an internet-based uh, platform to uh, increase accessibility. And um, one of the things that has to happen whenever you introduce technology is to help people get comfortable uh, with the use of it. I had the opportunity in Atlanta to help um, establish um, a peer-run uh, program that we organized all of our activities around the use of acquiring computer skills because in Atlanta at that time, technology was everything. Um, if you wanted a good job, if you wanted to network with people, if you wanted to um, uh, open up any kind of, uh, <coughs> kind of a business future for yourself, you had to have some technical skills. And what I discovered that for people with the lived experience, um, acquiring computer skills was a very equalizing experience. The computer does not care um, if you hear voices. Um, n nor does the computer care if your clothes match, which um, both of those seem to be huge concerns in a mental health center. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but all that is to say, um, the same care and practical approach for engaging the first person user of services needs to be given to the provider of services. Um, and, and to show them the ways that this will benefit them as well. Uh, for instance, one of the assessments that's done in the software program specifically um, uh, addresses some of the uh, required uh, questions that nurses have to ask people around safety issues. And so one of the, one of the ways to get buy-in was this, this, adding this to what you do in med clinic will not add to your workload, but in fact will help relieve some of the pressure of your workload. And, and so being mindful of that uh, and, and showing everybody how they benefit. Uh, helps get buy-in. Okie dokie, what I'd like to do now is just thank you for your attentiveness. 
Thank you for being here, and it's my understanding that what you get now is a break. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy that as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>